And this is my work with Rick Zaliski and Drew Seavey, and we're all from Interactive Visual Media Group at Microsoft Research. Uh, the talk is titled Fast Photon Blending Using Multi Spline. Okay, uh, first, I'm going to start out with uh, some examples that motivate why we're doing this work. Right, so, here's some example applications. The first is aerial imagery. Here's an example of um, the, the raw source images captured by a plane flying over this, uh, over this area, this part of the Earth. And these are completely uncompensated. This is the raw source images put down. So we can still see these strong seams between the images. So this is a very large scale image stitching problem, a right? very multi gigapixel uh, stitching problem. And what we'd like to see is that at the end of the day. This is what we'd like to serve up on the web when people visit uh, this, this imagery. Uh, another application is image pasting. Here's a uh, picture of Alex and Heather on the beach. Uh, Alex has his eyes open, but unfortunately Heather doesn't. And also there's somebody uh, moving around in the background behind here. So if we could ideally cut uh, from another image and paste in uh, some better pixels there, we'd like to just do a good job fusing that together. And that's, that's the result we'd like to enable. Okay. And of course, panorama stitching. Here's four images uh, captured at this busy market in Rome. Uh, we'd like to use that all together into one good looking panorama. So the framework uh, I want to use for this uh, was actually developed by a team, Agarwal here, uh, called Interactive Digital Photo Montage. And what this does is it, it uh, breaks the problem into two steps. The first is an intelligent scene selection that we solve via graph cut. So here we have that first image in the panorama. And notice the, the scene selector sort of moves down here and then tried to move around the moving people and just cut through the next image where there was no motion. So it, it found a, a seam through these images where there was a nice place to cut. And it, it was only cutting through the background parts of the scene. Right? And likewise, we do that with the rest of the images. Okay, and once we've selected those scenes, I'm not sure if this shows up in the projector, but there's still some exposure differences. There's lighting changes and exposure differences as you as you pan your camera. So we want to remove those. Uh, and for that, the second step of photo montage is to use this gradient domain fusion uh, technique. Uh, and that does a nice job cleaning up, uh, uh, generating this final panorama for us. Uh, so one thing I, I really, so we want to use this technique, and one thing I really like about it is that uh, it, it's, it's very robust to even this very busy scene, right? There's a lot of pixels between the images that don't agree with each other. But if we can find this one seam between the images where, where there is correspondence, then we can use that to reason what the exposure differences and lighting differences were between, between the images. So, so this is a framework I'd like to use. But, uh, so let me talk about what gradient uh, domain fusion is. Okay, so let's uh, just look at the problem in 1D. So here's two signals, U1 and U2, and uh, they have a different level, but we'd like to fuse these together, and they have a different sort of area of, of influence here. And we'd like to fuse these together into a, a fuse signal. So uh, let me just draw in a sub subset of the gradients on, this, on these signals. We'll call those G1 and G2. And what we'd like to produce is this S signal, that's a fuse of those two, the U1 and U2, that matches the gradients as, as closely as possible. We're not going to match the gradients exactly, but we, let's get the best fit for the gradients that we can. Okay. And written down in math, this was introduced in SIGGRAPH 2003 by Perez. Uh, this is the, the error function that we want to minimize. So here we see this, and this is also now in 2D instead of 1D. So here we see our F signal, the gradients in F in X and the gradients in F in Y need to match some gradient guidance field. And in our stitching uh, application, that target gradient field is just the gradients of the input images, right? And we can also apply a per pixel smoothness term. So, okay. But now, remember the, the applications I showed at the, at the beginning. You know, I want to do this on gigapixel images. I want to do this in this image pasting application, which is potentially interactive, right? And these F 
terms, there's one of those for every pixel in your output, right? So for a gigapixel image, this is a very big linear system to solve. Right? So let's see if we can do, if we can optimize that at all, right? Let's go back to the 1D example. Uh, now we have our input signals and our output signal. And if you look closely, you can actually um, see that there's this offset field that if we apply to U, we get F, right? And there's something nice about this offset field in that it's smooth, that it's piecewise smooth, right? So maybe we can take advantage of that. So let's reformulate the problem, right? We have that F signal. Now that becomes the input signals plus this offset field. And now we'll, let's redefine the gradients. The gradients are the gradients of the offset field instead. And they have this very nice property that they're zero everywhere except at the seams, and at the seams they're the average intensity difference. Right? And written down, uh, this is the error term that we want to minimize. Um, very similar to the previous one, except now we're solving for H. And we also add this other data term at the end. And what this does is depending on the, the value of W, this has the offset field this penalizes um, large offset fields, so this encourages or discourages the, the solution to go back to the original color values more quickly or less quickly. Okay, so Asim actually noticed this in, in a different paper that he published, and it's called the um, Efficient Gradient Domain Compositing Using Quad Trees, right? So here's a, a, a panoramic example from his paper, and the, the cut lines between the images are shown in red here. And these are the actual variables that he solves for. So he, he uses this quad tree encoding of this offset field that I described, right? So notice this is much more efficient than solving an un uh, for an unknown at every pixel, right? Um, but it still is, is quite dense around the seams between the images. So there's still, there's still quite a few variables to solve for here, even in the, especially like in, in, in a gigapixel stitching example. So can we improve on this at all? Let's see. So here's our, our piecewise smooth offset field, right? Um, and, and in that quad tree color map I just showed, we actually had to encode the, um, the piecewise nature of this, right? But what if we consider separate offset fields, right? So there's a separate offset field for every input. Now, the separate offset field will just uh, remove the piecewise nature of this and we'll treat the pieces independently, these separate offset fields are actually smooth. So there's probably a better way to encode that. And here, and what we do there is we just encode that as a, um, using a uh, set of spline ver vertices. So a spline function encodes this smooth offset field. Right? And this is really the key insight of the paper uh, that enables us to, to, to use this gradient domain compositing for very large problems. Okay, let's uh, switch to 2D now. So here's a toy example, a blue image coming together with a pink image. And um, the, the blue boxes and pink boxes represent the spline grid that we're solving. And notice we don't, these are light blue and light pink up here. We don't have to solve for these. These aren't variables that we have to solve for outside the domain of the pixel values, right? So, uh, at the boundary between these images, these spline grids actually overlap. Right? So I'll zoom in on that. And the, the spline grids actually do overlap with each other. I'm just showing them separated slightly for illustrative purposes here. So I inside one of these blue boxes, um, we accumulate the error terms for the, uh, the blue vertices, but we actually have to do no work because remember inside there, the, um, the, desired offset, the desired gradients in the offset field are zero. Right, so we only have to visit the pixels along the boundary here, right? And along the boundary, we visit the, the edge between, the, or the seam between the two images and accumulate error terms into both the, the uh, blue uh, vertices and the, and, the, and the pink vertices. And this is how the, the solutions get coupled to, to each other of the, the blue vertex grid and the pink vertex grid. But this is, this is a really nice advantage that we only have to visit the color values along the seam, so we take advantage of this in, in these very large stitching problems. Okay, so let's look at the, the constraints along the, the seam here. Back in 1D, uh, 
So here we have two gradients at the seam from signal U1 and signal U2. And there is, an, there is a smooth offset field that will make those two gradients line up. Okay. But if we look at a, a case, perhaps we had misregistration or there's texture in the seam, uh, we might see a seam like this. And there is no smooth offset field that will make those two gradients line up. So this is how we actually, uh, this gets encoded into that smoothness term that I described earlier. And so we look at the, um, the difference, the absolute value of the difference in the gradients and use that to weight the different constraints going into the, into the solver. Uh, and this, um, this makes the solution much more robust to, um, to outliers along the seam or bad, for example, misregistration. And this, uh, this weighting function was adapted from, uh, from this hog paper. Okay, so let's look at our um, four image panorama example again. Here's the vertex grid overlap with one of the source images. Another vertex grid, a separate vertex grid for the other source image, and so on. And another key advantage of our technique is that we can accumulate the errors on a low resolution version of the images, right? Because, um, and this is, this is uh, key to our technique and this isn't possible with the, with the quad tree approach. Okay, so um, how do we solve this problem? It's a, uh, it's a sparse problem. It, we've got four diagonal smoothness terms and there are some additional off-diagonal terms at the, uh, at the image boundaries or at the, the spline grid boundaries. Uh, you could just throw this in the MATLAB, but in our shipping products, we use a simple nested dissection reorder on this that reduces fill-in, and we can just solve this uh, directly using a direct solver. Okay? Uh, so something else we introduced in the paper is doing this in the log domain, right? So an additive offset field, so if we compute the uh, differences along the seam in the on the log of the pixel values, that results in a multiplicative instead of additive offset field, right? So in some cases, this is more appropriate. For example, if you're dealing with uh, raw image sensor pixels, for example, where there's just exposure differences between the, the pixels, you, you, want to, you want to compute a gain field instead of a, an additive offset field. So. So this is one of the, the parameters in, in the system. Okay, so let's look at a, a difficult example. Here's a, uh, some images taken of a beach scene. And uh, there are lighting changes and exposure differences here. So the, the basic system does a, a pretty good job of compensating for the, that, that smooth offset or that smooth um, variation between the, between the images. But if we, if we zoom in on this section, for example, there's a couple problems. The aligner didn't do a great job aligning these images, so we have some misregistration there. And the wave pattern is just very different because these are taken at, at different points in time, right? Uh, so this is, uh, can you see that there? This is the solution of just using the multi-spline Poisson. And I'll just uh, point your eye to this section here. What the solution isn't as smooth as we'd like because the solver's fighting very hard to fix this gradient here, which is which is really doesn't fit our model of the smooth offset field. So by introducing those constraint weights, we can remove some of the some of the differences along the seam here, right? And our, our model fits better now. And then finally, because there are different textures here, we use just a very old Burton Adelson technique. Just for 10 pixels along the seam, we use a Laplacian pyramid blend of three levels. And that, that removes uh, most of the moving texture differences. So that's, that's quite inexpensive to compute. Uh, okay, let's look at the performance of this. And these, this is a, a team gave us his uh, data for the, the quad tree paper. So just look at the first line here. Uh, so there's a 34.6 megapixel result, right? And this is the percentage of those pixels that turn into to vertices or to, into variables rather. That, that we're trying to solve for. So here we're at 0.47 of the data set of the pixel count needs to, needs, uh, turns into variables. So that's, that's a, a much smaller problem than solving every pixel. Um, but in our technique, uh, we're at 0.027% of the pixels have variables associated with them. So 
right? So that uh, results in a nice speed up. It takes about seven seconds to render this, this out. 3.3 uh, .3 of those seconds are just in the setup of visiting the, the color values in the images. The solve is pretty fast. And the final step is the render where we upsample that offset field and apply it to the, uh, to the color source images. Sorry. Oh, M is the memory footprint, so we measure the, the memory uh, being used. So uh, there's a corresponding nice reduction in, in amount of memory used to, you know, to, to represent the, the linear system. Uh, uh, so one example that wasn't in a Seams paper is this Seattle uh, gigapixels, a 3.2 gigapixel image. And here, uh, so we took advantage of one, there's, there's several parameters that we can play with in the system. Here we uh, increase the spline spacing uh, quite a bit, so we have yet a further reduction. And in this particular data set, that since we had a very smooth offset field to apply, this was appropriate, and we could get away with um, solving for even a smaller system relative to the number of pixels. Uh, and here, the setup time took only six seconds to visit all the seams along the, uh, the images, again, because we can do this at a low resolution version of the images. The solve was quite fast. And in the paper, we report, I think, a 56-minute render time to, to page in all those images and apply uh, apply the offsets to them. But now, in our latest shipping code, there's about four minutes to, to render out this, uh, this 3.2 gigapixel image. Okay. So let's, a quick comparison of the data, of the results from a Seams paper and our paper, comparable images, not exactly the same results, but comparable. So here's the gigapixel results from our paper in 2007. Uh, this is shot, this is 800 images shot over about an hour and a half. Notice large exposure differences and uh, li there's lighting changes too in this scene over that hour and a half. So if I page over to the results using our sitter, and this is, uh, you can browse this on my Photosynth webpage, this is up online. Uh, that's the results of um, applying our fast photon technique. So it's a, it's a nice seamless result that, that compensates for both the lighting changes and exposure changes. So this has found a home in a variety of Microsoft products. Uh, so Bing Maps is currently rendering out the United States at 30 centimeters resolution for the entire country. And this fast photon technique is being used to do that. We have a download you can try out called Microsoft Ice. It's a panorama sitter. Uh, there's an app called PhotoFuse, which implements that image pasting feature I showed which allows a user to select the best parts of two images and, or, or a stack of images and, and fuses them into the ideal image. And since this is, is computationally very efficient, we've even ported this to the iPhone and the Bing uh, iPhone app team has announced a panorama maker that runs, that runs in the iPhone. No, visit the Photosynth blog. I can't talk too much about it, but visit the Photosynth blog and there's a, a video that shows it. And, I can't say when it's going to ship, but it's not too long. Um, so, uh, so the best embodiment of this of this work is in a sort of our research prototype where we throw a lot of these technologies in. It's called Microsoft Ice. It's an image stitching application, and it implements everything that I've, I've shown in the in the talk. Uh, we just ship this fun new feature that that takes a video in and, and generates one of these motion summaries straight out, and and the nice uh, clean seams between these, the snowboarder here is, is due to the fast photon technique. So, uh, quick summary. So, offset fields are smooth. We can take advantage of that. And we can compute multiple overlapping offset fields. We don't have to do this piece by uh, And That allows us to represent the offset fields of 2D splines, which is more efficient than a quad tree, and resolution independent. Uh, we can downweight, we introduce a way of downweighting the constraints in problem areas and also introduce a multiplicative gain field instead of just an offset field. And finally, introduce this concept of a local Laplacian blend uh, just along the seam pixels between uh, two images of, of a stitch. Wrong way. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Matt Brown. Are you, uh, are you still uh, you know, solving for radius? The offset, there's no offset in radius, right? That, that's right. I mean, I think in radiance space, that's why the, I think the log 
uh, domain stitching is, is more appropriate there, or that the multiplicative offset field is more appropriate. So uh, if you were to do this in radians, I would somehow invert. You know, like a lot of our products have to deal with whatever a user throws at them. And, and I find that like if you're dealing with JPEG images, which we don't know how they were developed, the offset field is, is, is a pretty good is a pretty good hack. But if uh, in the gigapixel stitching paper, we dealt in really radiant space. We, we shot raw images. We white balanced them all the same. And there, um, there the multiplicative uh, offset field is more appropriate. So. It doesn't in ours. It, it does in the, in the quadtree representation. The quadtree has to encode the scenes, right? So you need a variable per scene pixel. In ours, it's, it's, it really just depends on the, the spline spacing that you choose. Right, the spline spacing has to somehow uh, be expressive enough to uh, compensate for whatever's going on. So, uh, well, I mean, the, the key. The key thing we're taking advantage of, this is really just for in image stitching is a key ap is the uh, application we're trying to enable. And in image stitching, typically the, the things that you're trying to compensate for are lighting changes or exposure differences. Um, and those are very smooth, right? So, so a spline can encode, a smooth spline per image can encode those kind of variations. We don't have, we typically don't have very busy scenes, right? So I'll be around for the rest of the week. Exactly.